and everybody, and thank you for joining us at Secular AZ today. We are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state uh, in Arizona for over a decade. The election has come and gone, and we're all still watching the AG race, where at last count, Chris Mays still has a razor thin lead over Abe Hamaday. Uh, we know that there is still a GOP one seat advantage in both chambers and um, that there was some good, bad and ugly results otherwise. So uh, on Sunday, if you want to learn more, I will actually be presenting to the Humanist Society of Great Greater Phoenix on Sunday morning about these results. So you can go to their website and uh, check it out and register for that event if you are interested. Um, oops, I lost my screen again. Hold on just a second. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, it's gonna be a good discussion. There's not gonna be any programming next Friday because it's the Thanksgiving holiday and everybody should mark their calendars for December 10th, 2022 for our Secular Summit. Uh, Thomas Lecoq is an Associate professor, professor of History at Grandview University. He has a PhD in pre-modern European history, an MA in English, uh, with a focus on Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Norman literature, and a BA in history with minors in philosophy and religion and English. He is a member of the French Humanities Research Group. Uh, oh boy, I don't speak French. La de anybody, anyway, I, I'll let you say that. Um, and his research uh, focuses on, oops, I'm missing a bit here, but he's written for the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, The Bulwark, and Religion Dispatches, among other publications. I'm so sorry for um, for, for my no crazy worries. kind of introduction today. And uh, I'm so glad that you're here. And is there anything from your bio that I should have added or that I overlooked? No, listen, that's great. I This is kind of the weirdness of what I do now. I, uh, I'm i a medievalist by training who over the last three years basically just writes about American history. Um, and that's kind of what we're gonna, we're gonna dive into today that, uh, you know, it, it's like things have been eventful over the last couple of years. Right. Just a scotch. Well <laughs> right? Well, that yeah. sounds like nice work if you can get it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Thomas, and thank you again for joining us today. Yeah, well, th thank you so very much for having me. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for hopping online to join me for part of your Friday uh, to talk about horrible things. Um, and what a what a heck of a month it's been. Um, to those of you who are in Arizona, I can only imagine the relief you feel at uh, at least uh, some of the slate of Christian Nationals candidates uh, being defeated. Uh, and for those of you elsewhere, I mean, fingers crossed your election results were uh, were better than I was. Um, so what I what I study is religious violence and apocalypticism. Uh, and I study it from kind of the Middle Ages to the modern day. Uh, and that's how I kind of fell into this topic. So how to put this in, in a way that is not deeply depressing. Um, crusading rhetoric never goes away. We really like the idea that at some point uh, the Middle Ages ended and we all became enlightened and things are going better. And then you turn on the news or you listen to uh, campaign ads or you follow anything that's happening in the contemporary GOP and you kind of know better. Um, we really like to think that holy war is something that is desperately other. It's not something we do here. It's not a rhetoric that is ongoing and engaged. That's something from the past. That's foreign. That's old. That is, uh, that, that's a distant memory. It's medieval in not the sense of actually middle ages, but the way we use it as a way of describing something that is backwards in this pejorative sense. Um, and unfortunately, as you know, 2016 to 2020, uh, and as the 22 midterms showed us yet again, crusading rhetoric and imagery is alive and well in the contemporary far right. That's because these ideas never really die. The language changes slightly, much less than we'd like, uh, and keeps coming back over and over and over again. So today I want to talk about kind of the crusades and contemporary far right politics together. Uh, so we're going to start by talking a little bit about uh, the Crusades and QAnon. We're going to move on to Crusader imagery on rifles, and then we're going to look at a couple of uh, military officers who happen to have engaged in the rhetoric and trappings of holy war since leaving office, and then end on the type of event that happened uh, in 2021 and once again last week in Maricopa County, Jericho marches. And so just a little, a little taste and flavor of kind of the uh, genuine horror of the way holy war rhetoric keeps going. So since I'm a crusade historian, let's let's start by talking about the crusades. Um, there's not really a great segue into uh, 
but giving a discussion on actual holy wars. Um, and the kinds of stuff that's happening right now are not crusades in the official sense, uh, papally sanctioned wars launched with the goal of taking and holding Jerusalem by a wide variety of routes that lasted from 1096 until 1798. I, again, I know that we like the idea that the Crusades are this really distant thing, and, and they are, but only by about 200 years. Um, the Crusades are launched by per, Pope Urban II at the Second Council at the Council of Clermont in 1095 in France, and they don't end until Napoleon Bonaparte conquers the Knights of Malta in 1798, officially ending the military mission of the Crusades. Despite the fact that they're over, the far right loves the concept and rhetoric and imagery of the Crusades, uh, or at least the mythical idea of the Crusades, not the actual history, but the imagery of it. Uh, Templar memes, I'm sure at some point, you, if you've been on the internet, you've seen the image of Trump on a horse in Templar garb. Um, and if you have not, then your eyes have been spared and you should not find this. You're happier than I am. This kind of imagery is very common. I've written about the love affair with the Templars elsewhere. Um, you know, every good conspiracy theory in the West either comes, uh, kind of comes down to, to Templar conspiracy theories at this point, and we'll come back to that. But the thing about the First Crusade is that, you know, there's the actual historical aspects, and then there are the bits and pieces that get drawn on that keep popping up, and I wanted to talk about um, one of them. So I, I know that the spring wasn't that long ago, but over the last, like, I mean, at this point, it feels like six years, time gets really weird because there's so many awful things in the news that my sense of when things happened has really broken down. So the spring doesn't feel like that long ago, but it actually was. Uh, the so-called People's Convoy, the anti-vaccine, anti-mask, anti-mandate uh, group that was modeled loosely on the group that was occupying the Canadian uh, capital of Ottawa, um, spent weeks circling the Beltway in DC from their base in Hagerstown, Maryland. And when they were getting ready to leave, um, one of the participants in Hagerstown gave a small speech um, that is actually worth listening to for a second. It's kind of Link of Crusades. And the sound isn't working from my screen, but if you wanna put up the uh, the video version, that'd be great. Give a second, see if we can get to switch over. Can't get it to switch over properly. I'll try, I can try from here. Oh, I'm sorry. I have it up, but it is uh, not playing on mine either, of course. Yeah, that's okay. Well, here, we'll do the image and then I can read the uh, the text. So you see this, uh, this gentleman in this garb is uh, wearing Neo-Templar uh, armor. Um, I mean, it's completely homemade. There, there are no Knights Templar, despite what all the conspiracy theorists would love to tell you. The Knights Templar get disbanded. They're not real. Um, when asked if this convoy was a crusade, since he is dressed in this kind of fake crusader garb, what the man said was, is this a crusade? Yeah, I believe it's a people's crusade. Doesn't, doesn't, you know, it can be peaceful, but it's a crusade in the fact that people have to fight the evil in the world, man. And the evil is, well, you're heading down to the evil and the world and the people have to band together and fight on the side of the Lord. God wills it. Now, other than the fact that it's a massive word salad, and I think that we can uh, give it credit for being a massive word salad. There is an awful lot of imagery just in that little bit. Um, the link between Crusader cosplay and white supremacist groups has been evident for quite a while. Um, the use of Crusader imagery to support uh, violent anti-Muslim, uh, anti-Semitic, uh, aggressively far-right ideas. Um, the use of God wills it, uh, Deus Volt, the theoretical battle cry of the First Crusade, pops up in a lot of far-right spaces. And the idea that you, uh, you know, the idea that it's a peaceful crusade is, is ludicrous, um, but the idea that you have to fight the evil in the world, you have to band together and fight on the side of the Lord is this idea that recurs over and over again. Now, this idea of a people's crusade is interesting. It's obviously not a crusade, right? The Pope is certainly not sanctioning anything like this. Um, but the People's Crusade is not actually a crusade in traditional sense. There is an event called the People's Crusade on the first half of the First Crusade. So the actual appeal happens outside of the Cathedral of Clermont in November 1095. It's made to bishops, abbots, secular lords. Um, it's, it's a very kind of official appeal to muster an army to go on an armed pilgrimage to take Jerusalem. Very quickly, the message jumps beyond that, right? This is the problem with ideas, that ideas like viruses uh, spread well beyond the original confines and mutate as they go. 
So as uh, my doctoral advisor, Jay Rubenstein, described it in his 2011 book, Armies of Heaven, in Northern Europe, and I quote, a violent, apocalyptic, somewhat acephalous movement rooted in the expectation of end times and of an imminent battle with Antichrist took root. And from there, other preachers, pilgrims, prophets, zealots, and crackpots delivered sermons infused with their own particular apocalyptic and feral sensibilities. And this is, for me, a part where the kind of uh, a number of the weirdest iterations of the contemporary far right feel oddly connected. And for me, the part I always link to this is this is QAnon. This is the heart of QAnon, uh, a weird, uncouth, seemingly funny at times uh, group that is also an incredibly murderous, violent collection of ideologies with a desperately apocalyptic bent. So to spread their message, these groups that make up the People's Crusade uh, drew on signs that may or may not have existed. It's conspiracy theory stuff. The records in one of the German chronicles uh, that a, a priest of honorable life named Sigarius witnessed two horsemen charging through the skies and for a long time doing battle against uh, one another. Another priest claimed to have seen a sword of wondrous length that a whirlwind seemed to be waving about that flew off into the heavens. That people uh, experienced the stigmata of crosses stamped on their brows, a list of bizarre births and other signs that led every creature to join his creator's army, but the enemy, ever alert while others sleep, lost no time in raising up pseudo-prophets. Um, QAnon is a massive conspiracy theory, and it's a really bizarre conspiracy theory, and it's a conspiracy theory that falls into the idea of kind of a big tent where every other conspiracy theory can come home to roost and find its links into the core ideology, which is that the world is controlled by a cabal of Satan-worshipping pedophiles who are ritually torturing children to harvest a hormone from them to prolong their life. And if that sounds completely insane, good, good. If it sounds completely insane, excellent. We want it to sound completely insane. They believe that this will all end in something called the storm where the military will round up the cabal and execute them on TV while people can watch and eat popcorn. Um, this is all very surface level. QAnon, anyone who is wearing QAnon paraphernalia knows this part. It's not subtle at all. And this is the part where some of the aspects of, of the crusade end up feeling very much like QAnon, that there are all of these weird things happening in the People's Crusade. There are all these laughable moments that chroniclers like to make fun of that kind of hide the fact that at its core, all of the ridiculous, mockable parts cover up the fact that it is a mass murder fantasy. So one of the first crusade chroniclers, a guy named Albert of Aachen wrote of a gathering of people on foot who were stupid and insanely irresponsible, who claimed that a certain goose was inspired by the Holy Ghost and a she-goat filled no less with the same. And they had made these their leaders for this holy journey to Jerusalem. A separate chronicler wrote uh, it as the silly tale about the goose who is supposed to have led her mistress and many others of that sorts. And all of these monastic chronicles are making fun of this because when you're far away from it, it's easy to mock this experience. Um, they're safe in their monasteries. These are people following ridiculous leaders. There's another version that is uh, starts similarly but ends in a much bigger tragedy. The Chronicle of Solomon Bar Simpson, a 12th century edited collection of Jewish historical accounts, recounts the same story. And in their version, one day, a Gentile woman came bringing a goose which she had raised since it was a newborn. The goose would accompany her wherever she went. The Gentile woman now called out to all the passers-by, look, the goose understands my intention to go straying and desires to accompany me. Despite this, groups gathered and used the so-called wonder to threaten the Jewish community of Manz, that the magic goose was a signal that they should exact vengeance from their enemies. The crusaders attacked the townsfolk until a crusader was slain, at which point the group called out, the Jews have caused this, and both groups joined forces to attack the Jewish community. And this is actually part of the framework of a lot of what we call the People's Crusade that's also part of the framework of QAnon. Uh, even the most laughable groups on the far right are dangerous. QAnon is very much one of them, and there are other groups that are more organized. We love to get bogged down in the kind of the absurdity of some of these far right groups, the way that they dress in laughable outfits, the way their ideology makes no sense. There was the group that had gathered in Dallas under uh, Michael Protzman, who claimed that JFK Jr. was not dead, but had been in hiding and was going to reappear. And this seemed very funny, um, but it's still part of this murderous ideology that he's going to reappear and lead an effectively messianic movement to slay all of their enemies. And it's the part where it feels ridiculous and so we feel safe, but we have to remember that it feels ridiculous up until the action starts, right? The woman following a goose is laughable until her followers begin massacring the Jewish community of Mounds. 
And others are a bit more organized than this. One of the other people who joins in on the, on the People's Crusade um, present himself as an avatar of uh, what we call the Last World Emperor, this apocalyptic legend from the Middle Ages that uh, a secular, flawed leader would unite the people together, would go to Jerusalem, would lay down his crown on the Mount of Olives, and would bring about the apocalypse. And there was a man named Count Emiko of Floheim who takes up this path. The Chronicle of Solomon Bar Simpson describes him as the oppressor of all the Jews. May his bones be ground to dust between millstones. And he forms the main villain of the surviving Jewish accounts of the Rhineland massacres. Um, all of the Latin chronicles describe this in very calm tones. It's not like this is not being described in Latin chronicles. Um, but it gets described in Solomon Bar Simpson's chronicle as an apocalyptic vision. He was made leader of the hordes and concocted a tale that an apostle of the crucified one had come to him and made a sign on his flesh to inform him that when he arrived at Magna Graeci, Jesus himself would appear and place the kingly crown on his head and Emiko would vanquish his foes. Um, the crusaders, when they get, uh, get to cities like Metz, and this is a, a painting made in the 19th century of the destruction of Metz, um, that the crusaders said, look now, we're going a long way to seek out the profane shrine and to avenge ourselves on the Ishmaelites. We're here in our very midst are the Jews, they whose forefathers murdered and crucified him for no reason. Let us avenge ourselves on them and exterminate them from among the nations, leading to massacres in all of the cities they passed in. This kind of ideology doesn't disappear in the 11th century, obviously. The uh, Rhineland pogroms during the First Crusade are often brought up as one of the kind of first major examples of pogroms in Western Europe, in Germany. And we know that this does not stop there. But this ideology is alive and well in the contemporary far right among groups who really do push an apocalyptic vision that includes the purification of this country. Um, Andrew Torba, who's the founder of GAB, uh, is the co-author of a book supporting Christian nationalism, including a chapter called The Eschatology of Victory. Eschatology is the study of the end times. So it's this triumphalist apocalyptic vision of how you will bring about Christian nationalism on this continent. Um, he is a noted anti-Semite uh, in great and violent detail. And we'll come back to that. Doug Mastrano paid him for consulting certain services, also used dog whistles throughout his campaign against his opponent, Josh Shapiro, who is Jewish. The apocalyptic rhetoric, the embracing of violence, these themes will carry through. So let's let's move away from this and let, let's talk about a tangible object. This is the uh, Spikes Tacticals Crusader rifle. Uh, it's a pretty famous gun at this point. Um, Donald Trump Jr. has his own personal version of this that's tricked out to add a helmet uh, motif on it. And he has magazines with images of Hillary Clinton behind bars because these are just charming people with charming worldviews. The Crusader rifle is one of the least uh, the least subtle possible instances of taking Crusader ideology and putting onto a weapon like this. The website for Spikes Tactical describes the gun in this way: Spikes Tactical create a balanced fighting a balanced, reliable rifle that would bring an excellent fighting rifle to people of all abilities and resources. The Everyman Fighting Rifle. We named it Crusader and engraved Psalm 144:1 on the lower receiver to hoist the flag of our faith and make a statement, reminding our customers that we are with you. The war is here. We have a duty to defend our homeland and our way of life. And there are just so many red flags uh, in that brief paragraph. It's, it's horrifying. 144.1 reads, uh, praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. Right. The war is here. Wow, that's a heck of a statement to be putting on a gun that you're trying to sell to civilians. Um, we have a duty to defend our homeland and our way of life is very much a series of, I mean, they're not even dog whistles at this point. This is shouting them through a bullhorn and then using this biblical passage, which is a war psalm, is really putting in a very specific kind of rhetoric. The gun itself goes beyond just this, though, and has a couple of uh, rhetorical flourishes on it. It's the Crusader, so it has an engraved Templar shield on it. Uh, and then it has three settings in English on one side, in uh, Latin on the other, which are um, safety, single fire, and semi automatic with the names Pax Pacis, Peace, Bellum, War, and Deus Volt, God wills it for semi automatic, um, which is again the first crusade battle cry that is very popular with the far right. Um, and they're, they're aware of this. In 2015, when they first released this rifle, which they're still selling now, uh, a spokesman said that using, using these images and the psalm on it ensures that, and, and I quote, um, ensures that no Muslim terrorist will ever pick up this weapon and use it to bring harm against another person. That's actually my favorite part of the rifle, which is complete nonsense, obviously. Bible verses aren't 
magic anti-Muslim kryptonite. This is the, the whole idea is the most um, tell me you know nothing about Islam without telling me you know nothing about Islam nonsense imaginable. Um, if you have never actually engaged with the Quran, Jesus of Nazareth appears repeatedly throughout it, but fine. Different topic. The idea that this gun, though, named after the holy wars waged by Catholics against Muslims, Jews, pagans, and other Christians from 1096 for a 700 year swath of period is a weapon for Christians to use to hoist the flag of our faith and make a statement and also magically repels Muslims is a whole mess of Islamophobic Christian nationalist ideology in a single item. This is not the only one. This is the kind of best representative object, but the link between kind of Templar crosses and far right gear, um, gun culture, there's an awful lot of it. It's also a marketing gimmick, right? You're trying to sell these rifles to people who want something that will be, uh, pull a very specific thing, but making biblical verses connected to firearms is not new. This is a uh, picture of a tweet from Daniel Defense, um, which might be familiar to you because uh, the AR-15s used in the Massacre in Uvalde uh, were bought from Daniel Defense. And this one is using Proverbs 22, 6, train up the child uh, the, way, uh, the way he should go, and he will not depart from it to sell an AR-15. There's an awful lot of this idea of connecting Christianity to gun use in a lot of different contexts. Um, as Brad Stoddard has written in a piece for Religion Dispatches, AR-15s are also increasingly the firearm of choice for Christian gun owners who arm themselves, in their minds at least, in defense against both tyranny and evil. Um, it's really not a slippery slope from these kind of ideas to much more violent action, right? The idea of emblazoning a gun with biblical verses and crusade symbols as a specifically anti-Muslim aspect. Um, is is really a direct road to how you get to things like the violent language scrawled all over the Christchurch mosque shooters guns, who also painted on kind of very modern far right symbols on um, the Black Sun, Alexandre Bissonnet and Luca Trani's names, but also specific holy war references like Seb uh, Sebastiano Venier, a Venetian admiral who fought the Ottomans in the 16th century, several conscriptions for a 1770 victory by a small Russian army over the Ottomans, another for Serbian soldiers who fought against them. Duel 732, which we will come back to uh, later, and Charles Martel, John Hyande, David the Builder, and David Sosin of Georgia, and other medieval figures who fought in crusades and holy wars against Muslim forces are all very popular in the far right. And so this idea of selling popularly to the mass audience a gun with crusade imagery on it, that is literally the company is describing as something that Muslims can't touch, is part of this same kind of movement. So let's keep going with the AR-15 for a second um, to a broader trend that I worry a lot about and keep meaning to write on it. And every time I start, I learn new things and it's, I quit because it's so horrifying. There is a trend of former military officers who become Christian nationalist holy warriors. Um, and certainly not, I, I do not have statistical data. I have anecdotal, but it's something that needs to get worked on more. Um, in 2014, retired Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin uh, made headlines for saying that, and I'm going to let you read this along with me. Um, the Lord is a warrior. And in Revelation 19, it says when he comes back, he's coming back as what? A warrior, a mighty warrior, leading a mighty army, riding a white horse with a bloodstained white robe. I believe that blood on that robe is the blood of his enemies because he's coming back as a warrior carrying a sword. And I believe now, I've checked this out, I believe that sword he'll be carrying when he comes back is an AR-15. We can just take a moment to breathe in the, the, the wildness of this as an idea. And then he connects this directly to the Second Amendment as something that came from Jesus, um, and that the AR-15 is this sort of revelations. And I love that last bit. We can skim through some of that. And the sword today is an AR-15. So if you don't have one, go get one. You're supposed to have one. It's biblical. Now, this narrative is a very aggressively Christian nationalist one, this idea of connecting uh, America, the Second Amendment, the Constitution to a kind of specifically biblical aspect that this is where our government comes from. Um, but Boykin's comment here that this is an apocalyptic weapon has so many more flavors. Boykin has a long history of militant Christian rhetoric, uh, including explicitly anti-Muslim comments when he was the deputy undersecretary of military intelligence under the Bush administration. Um, he also connected himself directly to a crusading legacy. He has claimed the position of Grand Chancellor of the Knights Hospitaller, Sovereign Order of St. John of Jerusalem, Knights of Malta in 2010. Now, this is not the official Knights of Malta, which still exists. They give up their military mission and they run hospitals in, in around the world now. This is a 
spin-off organization that claims that mantle to continue on a crusading legacy, um, deeply apocryphal from the actual organization. And he is the grand chancellor of this branch that has holdings in the United States. And he's not the, uh, he's not the only one. This is retired Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, uh, who is a former representative from Florida and former chair of the Texas GOP and ran the gubernatorial primary against Abbott this year. He also recently joined the so-called Sovereign Military Order of the Temple of Jerusalem, Knights Templar, one of the many modern takes on the defunct order. This has absolutely no connection to the real Templars. This is a cosplay organization of people claiming this mantle because the real order has been gone since the 14th century. Now, alongside a photo of West in this Neo-Templar cloak, he claims that I took an oath to protect the Christians in the Holy Land. Um, and you can look through his, his back history and his comments, and this is, again, the aggressive Christian nationalism of this. Now, these two are certainly the easiest to link to a specific overt crusade fantasy. Both of them joined pseudo-military orders, neither of which have real links, and post pictures themselves in this garb. There are two other military officers who embody the same kind of um, Christian nationalist rhetoric uh, and holy war ideology without actually going into the cosplay, and I think that it's worth spending a little bit of time with them. So in the middle, uh, with the red tie uh, and the little crucifix bin, is Matt Shea. Matt Shea is a former member of the Washington House of Representatives and a retired captain of the Washington Army National Guard. By himself, he's a microcosm of the American far right. He was on the board of Protect Marriage uh, Washington, an anti-same-sex marriage group. He organized the Spokane chapter of Act for, uh, for America, an anti-Muslim hate group. He was a founding member and chairman of the Coalition of Western States. He took over Covenant Christian Church from Pastor Ken Peters in 2020, when Peters moved to Knoxville, Tennessee to start Patriot Church. Um, his current church, On Fire Ministries and Kingdom Christian Academy, was in the news this summer because two of the sons of his men's group pastor were arrested in Coeur d'Alene. Both of them are members of Patriot Front. That by itself would be enough to make him interesting. But then there's the official investigative report uh, from the Washington House of Representatives issued on December 1st, 2019, that found that Shea had participated in multiple acts of domestic terrorism against the United States. This was participating in, organizing, planning, and promoting a series of right-wing occupations of federal land, the 2014 Bundy standoff in Nevada, the 2015 standoff in Priest River, Idaho, and the 2016 seizure of the Malheur uh, National Wildlife Refuge in Oregon. And all of this is just to say that he is complicated before we get to the holy war rhetoric. Because in October 18th, uh, in October 2018, Shea acknowledged that he had written and distributed a four-page long manifesto entitled Biblical Basis for War with strategies for a holy war army to use. And there are so many things you can you can say about it, even though it's a bullet point list. I'll just take a second while you're looking at this. In addition to the clothing they're wearing, the two people blowing shofars, we're going to come back to talking about shofars and why those get used the way that they do. So um, point two is when is it time for war? When God says it's time, prayer council uh, is a great starting point because war gets declared when they feel like declaring it. Uh, 10.2, uh, that people must surrender on terms of justice and righteousness if you're not going to have war. And that that means stop all abortions, no same-sex marriages, no idolatry or occultism, no communism, and must obey biblical law, which in 2018 seemed absolutely nuts, like full-blown Gilead cosplay. And now, it's just a really nice, um, too long, didn't read summary of Stephen Wolf's new book, The Case for Christian Nationalism, uh, which you should very much not buy. It's a pro-Christian nationalist account, but it's worth seeing uh, experts, uh, excerpts of because he's serious. Or the idea in 12b that a tyrant is someone who rules without God, followed by 12l3, assassination to remove tyrants is just not murder. Oh, and if the enemy does not yield after all of this, 10, uh, 10 c4, if they do not yield, kill all males. Now, this was released uh, four years ago, uh, but he hasn't stopped. In 2021, he told a crowd in North Idaho to prepare for total war at the Freedom is the Cure anti-mandate event, and he connected uh, the current moment to the Battle of Tour in 732, saying the army of Islam would go into churches and rape all the nuns on the altar until there were no more virgins left, and then they started the boys, which is absolutely not true. It's just anti-Muslim hate speech connected to a medieval battle where a raiding force was stopped by the Carolingians, but has become a touchstone for the European far right to talk about driving Muslim immigrants off the continent. Um, he then followed this on to COVID conspiracies and ended with, it's not enough to post online anymore. It's not enough to just show up at things like this. We have to organize. We have to fight back in every single sphere we possibly can. And if they come to take our guns, we will stand and look them in the eye and say, 
you are not taking one step further. This is the line of the sand. And our country will remain free for our kids and our grandkids. Amen. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ. And he will, this is Matt Shea. He will inevitably pop back up because he was also in Cordaline when Patriot Front was coming in, giving speeches on the other side of town. His church was running a uh, Wednesday evening apocalypse Bible study most of this year. I can't wait to see what fresh hell comes out of that. So let's go to uh, one last candidate who is going to look familiar to you before we go to Jericho marches, and then I can answer questions. This is Doug Mastriano, uh, the former Republican candidate for governor of Pennsylvania, who lost, which is one of my happy moments from this election, uh, is also a microcosm of everything wrong with the Republican Party. Mastriano's world is one of Christian supremacy, violence, open fascism uh, with a Christian nationalist tinge to it. He's a conspiracy theorist with ties to QAnon, uh, he tweeted beliefs attributed to QAnon at least 50 times, all of which were purged from his account after Media Matters began reporting on it. He's appeared at QAnon programs uh, and QAnon events. He promoted QAnon's predecessor, Pizzagate. Uh, and if you've forgotten Pizzagate, we can talk about it later. This is not even... All of that at this point is fairly mainstream. I mean, this isn't even as wild as like a Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, style affair. Uh, QAnon candidates are everywhere now. So... He is also a white Christian nationalist to the core. He uh, tends to argue that he's not a Christian nationalist while, uh, while arguing Christian nationalist beliefs. In an interview with the conservative radio channel in 2018, he claimed that Islam is not compatible with the constitution, claiming that the constitution was founded on Christian Judeo ideas and is only compatible with that worldview. Guess what? Not all religions are created equal. So certainly not his only Islamophobic record, um, but it's part of his broader conceptualization of the world, only Christianity has merit. As a state senator, he signed the Penn Proclamation for Peace and Unity, including the line, where is William Penn warned, if thou wouldst rule well, thou must rule for God, and to do that, thou must be ruled for him, men must be governed by God, or they'll be ruled by tyrants. Um, and he and his fellow signees very much want to collapse the separation of church and state. A separate movement called Pennsylvania for Christ, working on reestablishing the kingdom of God in Pennsylvania, uh, pushed for electing Mastriano, and Mastriano spoke at one of their events. This is very much not a fringe part of his worldview. He believed that America was a Christian a nation and that it should be imposed by law. Um, Master as an army colonel has been one of the voices calling to overturn the election for Trump. Uh, er, um, if you are aware of who uh, Eric Metaxas, who's a right-wing evangelical radio host, had uh, previously said that we need to fight to the death, the last drop of blood, because it's worth it. And Master Owen agreed and called the effort to overturn the 2020 election a death match with the Democratic Party. Um, this is not just rhetoric. Master was a featured speaker for Jericho March's December 12th rally, um, and we'll talk about them in a second. He was also there on January 5th and 6th. He crossed uh, he crossed the barrier fences. He bust in uh, Trump supporters to attend the Stop the Steal rally. Um, he has ties to right-wing militias. He appeared at the massive militia gathering in Gettysburg in July 2021. That was a response to an online hoax. He uh, apparently, when he was working for the War College, decided to dress up in a Confederate outfit um, for Halloween. He, uh, his security personnel were members of the LifeGate Church in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, which we'll talk about again in a second, included Scott Nagel, the regional leader of the Oath Keepers. And I assume that we all remember the Oath Keepers because today is the last day of their seditious conspiracy trial. Um, and he also has ties to Rod of Iron, which I just really want to spare you talking about unless you want to ask me questions about it, but the rod of iron church which believes the ar-15 is the rod of iron from revelations and uses them in liturgical ceremonies um this also goes back to a broader conception of anti-semitism brought in uh he paid uh gab uh five thousand dollars for consulting services andrew torba gab's founder uh has been very outspoken uh about uh, about the idea that jews don't belong in america he said about ben shapiro that we don't want people who are atheists we don't want people who are jewish we don't want people who are you know non-believers agnostic whatever this is an explicitly christian movement because this is an explicitly christian company uh, country and followed that up with ben shapiro is not welcome in the movement unless he repents and accepts jesus christ as his lord and savior. Andrew Torba is very outspoken about all this. There's no way that you could hire Andrew Torba for his services and not know that this is what he believes because he says it everywhere. Master to leave his Gab account after newspapers began reporting on this, but he also keeps using anti, uh, anti-Jewish anti dog whistles, um, anti-George Soros conspiracy theories, um, comments about globalist elitists against Josh Shapiro. And finally, he has ties to a series of prophets. And I want to take a moment here because when I see uh, prophets arguing that God is calling for violence and overturning of elections, it makes me once again think of the First Crusade. 
is after the siege of Antioch in 1098, the First Crusade develops a series of prophetic leaders who claim to have been visited by saints, the Virgin Mary, and Jesus Christ himself, that are urging them on the Holy War, that gave them relic weapons, that gave them instructions for restructuring society in an apostolic model to lead them to the apocalypse. Uh, they get more and more erratic as the crusade goes further and further along until the most popular of them gave a vision so bizarre and violent, caused a chunk of the crusade to turn against him and he dies in an ordeal. He calls the vision of the five wounds that divides up the army into three groups, pilgrims, knights, the people who defend them, uh, non-combatants who support them, all of whom are good, and then two others, the doubters and the cowards, and the prophecy, when asked what to do about them, the priest recounted that Jesus said, show them no mercy, kill them. They are my betrayers, brothers of Judas Iscariot. Give their worldly goods to the first rank proportionate to their need, and by this act, you will find the right way which you have so far circumvented. Just as other revelations came to pass as predicted, so shall these. Um, the bloody purge doesn't happen when you advocate killing the people with all the swords. The people with all the swords ignore you. But the idea of prophets urging violent action is unfortunately very real. The idea of prophetic figures urging Christian nationalism in the overturn of the election has been all over the far right. Uh, many of them connected to New Apostolic Reformation, and we could talk about that at length. Um, so journalist Christopher uh, Matthias wrote about the Mastriano campaign and the prophets associated with him for HuffPo uh, at the beginning of this month. Um, and the prophets are a pretty big part. So this LifeGate church where uh, Mastriano's security detail comes from uh, brought their own prophet in, a man named Cal Calvin Greiner, who said, I was instructed years and years ago to make a sword and to put on specific words, anointed and appointed, worship, warfare, prayer, intercession by the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ on one side, and the sword of the Lord on the other, the sword of the Spirit. And Griner claimed that the, this sword was in Doug Mastriano's office in the State House for 225 days, and he was told by God to take it to Philadelphia to be blessed. And then God said, after Philly, this must go to D.C. This must go to my capital in D.C. from Harrisburg. According to Griner along the way, he, God told him to stop at LifeGate, where they all laid hands on the sword at the front of the church and prayed from it. And I just wanted to put up the quote from Matthew's article because he was there when all of this was happening. O Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you and pray to you that you gave us this sword to bind the powers of Satan and cast it out. As the sword moves to Washington, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll send your angels in and around that building, Lord, and you'll touch the mighty angel of God and find the power of Satan in Washington and run him out of town, Lord. And then the people that they claimed out, so let God arise, let his enemies scatter, let those who hate God flee right now. And then the pastor took it on and takes the microphone and says, we welcome you all to LifeGate, the church in the country that's trying to affect the country. We truly believe that God has called the church to be more than a house of offerings, a house of sermons, a house of hymnals. This will be a house of activating people to be engaged in the world we live in. How many of you look forward to the return of Christ? That's coming, but you've got work to do until then. So again, the idea that Satan is occupying Washington coming to the 2020, uh, 2022 midterms, which means that the Democrats are the servants of Satan. There's the idea that God will help scatter his enemies in a spiritual warfare sermon that's being prayed over this sword. There's the idea that the church must influence politics in, in the kind of language that's been used by Christian nationalist organizations around the country. And an apocalyptic endpoint. How many of you look forward to the return of Christ? That's coming, but you've got work to do to bring it about. And what makes it even weirder is this is not the first sword that he'd been given in April at a QAnon affiliated event, the organizer gave him what she called the Sword of David, saying, you've been fighting for our country and you're fighting for our religious rights in Christ Jesus. Hand him a sword that is um, a kind of badly made broadsword that you could buy, like a, a mall outlet sword. And he picked it up and said, where's Goliath? All this is without even mentioning reawaken America, which I'm going to continue not do so because it needs its own separate talk. But this slide on the left is from its iteration in Mannheim, Pennsylvania, saying that the angel of death is coming for them all by year end. And if you recognize any of those pictures, well, you can be concerned enough by whose faces are up there. So let's end on Jericho marches, um, because they also timed all of this because Arizona got their own taste of it uh, recently enough. A Jericho march is used off and on for the last few decades by Christian groups protesting in support of social and political goals. Sometimes these cases these cases come on both sides of the spectrum. In 1990, there were Jericho marches for racial reconciliation, 2020 Jericho march in Texas following the killing of George Floyd. 
sometimes conservative. There are a ton of anti-abortion uh, Jericho marches. But the inspiration is the destruction of Jericho in Joshua 6, 1 through 25, when Israelite warriors marched around the city seven times as chauffeurs were blown and the Ark of the Covenant was carried in procession. So when a church announces what's called a Jericho march, you picture people you know, praying, walking around a building, trumpets blasting, maybe not a gospel song, because that's what we'd like to focus on, the idea of marching in hopes of a miracle. But what people seem to forget is what happens after this. So from Joshua 6, 20, 21, when the trumpets sounded, the army shouted, and at the end, at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. And so everyone charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with a sword every living thing in it. Men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. And every time you see people wandering out, evangelical Christians wandering around with chauffeurs like this, that is what they're representing. And I think that it's really important that we focus on the fact that they know what they're doing. And we need to catch up with where they are. Doug Mastriano, when he announced his uh, gubernatorial campaign, had a man there in a towel blowing a chauffeur as he announced his gubernatorial campaign. So in late 2020, the name Jericho March was adopted and claimed as an unregistered trademark by a new pro-Trump group, Jericho March. This is uh, for their December 12th rally. And then again, they show, and then they showed up again on January 5th. Uh, the organizers were Robert Weaver, a one-time Trump, admi uh, Trump administration nominee for director of Indian Health Services, and uh, Irina Grosu, who was an appointee in communications. They, uh, in their November 25th, 2020 press release, they said, just as the Israelites circled the walls of Jericho until the walls fell, so we use peaceful means of protest until truth, transparency, and justice prevail, stated Weaver. It is time for the people of God to activate in unprecedented ways. We have stayed silent for too long, but now the church is rising up. Our God is mightier than any earthly power, and he can restore truth and justice, said Grosu. They also wrote that the Jericho March is biblically focused on Joshua 6. Jericho was a city of false gods and corruption. Just as Joshua was instructed to march around the walls of Jericho seven times, Jericho marchers fa pray, fast, and march at a specific place and time until darkness is exposed and the walls of corruption fall down. And I think it's really important to pay attention to this rhetoric because when people use this name, they know what they're referencing. And I think that we spend a lot of time thinking that the people who have these ideas are ignorant and are misinterpreting the Bible. And actually, they simply, they know what they're doing. This is very specific. They know what verse they're playing around with. Now, they were active in the weeks between the 2020 election and the insurrection, most prominently on December 12th, 2020, at the Let the Church War rally. It was Michael Flynn's first public appearance after his pardon by Trump. Flynn there said, don't get bent out of shape. There are still avenues. We're fighting with faith and we're fighting with courage. The rally featured the blowing of shofars, comparisons to the last days, speakers who fell into the prophetic visionary category. One speaker from the stage said, we are at war. This is our battle cry. We stand for freedom. We stand for God. We stand for country. We stand for Trump. Three weeks later, they returned to Washington, calling on patriots, people of faith, and all those who want to take back America's to blow chauffeurs while marching around the Supreme Court building seven times at noon on Tuesday, January 5th, and then the Capitol seven times at noon on Wednesday, January 6th. And after reenacting the book of Joshua, when the walls of the Capitol didn't come down, Trump's supporters decided to go over them instead, carrying the biblical passage to their logical and theological conclusion by storming Congress. Now, the actual organization uh, collapsed after that. They, uh, they locked it down. They released two statements saying that the group had a history of totally peaceful marches for election integrity. That's aim was a peaceful prayer march where people of Judeo-Christian faith pray together, sing songs, and blow chauffeurs. That ideology spread. Uh, this spring, the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa had their own Jericho marches around the Canadian Parliament, uh, singing hymns, reciting the Lord's Prayer, blowing shofars, um, and engaging in spiritual warfare sermons, people speaking in tongues, praying for healing from vaccines, and to summon the Lord of Heaven's armies. And it carried on into the present. And we don't need the sound on this one. Um, but on November 12th, Wendy Rogers uh, got together a small group of uh, people uh, outside one of the ballot counting centers in Maricopa County. And they engaged in a Jericho march, circling the building seven times while praying and blowing on chauffeurs. Very clearly, knowledgeably doing what they're doing. This is images of them with the various flags. Uh, and various far right groups joining into it uh, as they go. Now, the thing that I find important about this is that we love the idea that these are, sorry, I'm gonna close this and get back to, my apologies. Jericho marches aren't benign and the first crusade ends with one. 
is an image of the uh, of the sacking of Jerusalem. Uh, when the crusading army besieged Jerusalem, one of the eyewitness accounts writes that after agreeing to assault the city, and I quote, clergymen with crosses and relics of saints should lead a procession with knights and the able-bodied men following, blowing trumpets, brandishing arms, and marching barefoot. It's a Jericho march. It's a Jericho march outside of Jerusalem. And when they finished, the army then marched up to the Mount of Olives, and the priest preached the assembled army. We followed the Lord to the spot of the ascension, and since we can do no more, let us forgive those who have hurt us so that Almighty God can be merciful to us. Shortly after this, the assault began earnest, leading to the breaching of the walls and the literal decimation of Jerusalem, with one of every out of every ten people are massacred, most of them killed on the Mount of Olives, so that the destruction of the, the description of the chroniclers is taken from Revelation because they cannot imagine anything more apocalyptic with blood up to the bridles of the horses. So listen, this is just a taste of kind of parallels and imagery and a little bit of look into how I started writing about the contemporary far right in this country. But I hope more than anything, it's a little window into the fact that none of the rhetoric of religious violence and apocalypticism in our country is new, which is unfortunate. It's not a weird blip in American consciousness. It's not an aberration. We're not in this magical moment in American history where all of these people are coming out from under their, under, you know, out of their caves to harass us. This is a feature of imperial Christianity with deep roots and a recurring rhythm. And that should worry us because it means electoral defeats aren't going to stop it. We can't talk our way out of it. We can't reason our way out of it. This is something that exists and keeps popping up through the centuries. But it also means because I think it's always important to end on a note of hope that we've seen it fail before and it will fail again. We just have to keep doing the work to make sure that it does. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Boy, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and start off with uh, what Kirk Alexander said, <laughs> because this is this is how it always goes on Fridays. He says, I will now be drinking heavily for the rest of the day, but after that, is there any way to constructively engage with these people? This is a question that comes up a lot and I'm kind of convinced that the answer is no, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that, Dr. Lecoq. I don't have a good answer for how, how we as random strangers can engage people who are deep in this movement constructively on this, um, because I think the appeals have to come from people who have personal connections to them. Um, and it's part of the unpleasant reason why you have to actually at some point, if you fall into a position of privilege where you are not the one being directly threatened, um, engage in these conversations with family members, friends who have fallen into this kind of Christian nationalist trap. I think more importantly, learning enough that you can construct reasonable arguments against these kinds of ideologies, point out the historic roots, point out the actions, and really the way this kind of rhetoric and imagery is problematic is not about swaying the extremists. It's about showcasing to all of the bystanders who don't know the roots of this, who don't know the problems of this rhetoric and this imagery, who don't think about the idea of what um, if, you know, America as a Christian nation means to people who are not Christian. You can sway the crowd around them, right? This is the principle of engaging, uh, of engaging with people on platform, on social media. By and large, it is not a good uh, venue for arguing with people in constructive ways because it always ends up in a fight. But you are leaving a record and trail for the people who are stumbling across these conversations to get a different viewpoint, to not just have this one record of presenting the world and the nation and history and religion, to just offer these alternative views to hopefully put some cracks in and see what can grow from them. Well, and it makes me think of, so, you know, uh, as many people here know, I myself was a state Senate candidate. It didn't quite go the way that I wanted. You know, I'm in a, a purple district. Um, but, uh, you know, I was speaking with a woman who was a poll watcher at the Deer Valley Airport and, um, you know, just trying to engage with her and try to try and even to find common ground. But there were a few things that she said to me that, you know, I don't, I don't know if we can do this with, with these people. So I appreciate what you said, because, you know, she said, I'm not worried about climate change because God has a plan. Uh, she said, uh, I, I asked her about the, the fact that, you know, the people that she was supporting had no exemptions uh, in, in cases of rape and incest for abortion. And she said that a rape victim should feel blessed if they got pregnant. Um, and, you know, when I pointed out some of the things that she said were important to her, that her opponents or that her, the people that she was supporting actually were, you know, didn't support those things. 
she basically just said, well, I'll have to do my research because that's not what they told me. And by they, I think she means, you know, the, the GOP or the people in her party at her uh, precinct meet or her legislative district meetings, whatever. So I think that you're right about trying to get into the folks who really aren't paying attention to this kind of stuff or even feel like, well, we shouldn't, you know, because there was another instance. We wanted to award a local a uh, reporter here for all the hard work he had done reporting on um, school board candidates and, and you know, talking about these mass mandates and shutting down schools and whatever, and was really doing some great journalistic work. And I said, we really want to honor you with a secular star award. And he said, oh, I wouldn't want to alienate my, you know, religious followers. And I was like, buddy, we're not talking about religion now. We're talking about political ideologies and, and white supremacy, and it's dangerous. And then, you know, he just kind of ghosted me. But but that, you know, that's the, the, the thinking. I'm going to go ahead and Diane Post is our head of legal here uh, and an Arizona treasurer, and she's kind of on fire today. So this is early on in your discussion, but she said, what percentage of these players are male? And I guess she's talking about some of these, you know, fringe movements. I would guess quite, I would guess the majority. Less than you'd like. Significantly less than you'd like. Um, I... I know that we want to make this uh, be, because of the kind of patriarchal nature of a lot of their claims and the fact that these are people who are advocating aggressive uh aggressively regressive gender-based roles you would think that'd be predominantly white men uh mm -hmm. it's predominantly white it's not necessarily predominantly men um I think in the same way that you have to remember that the second clan, which I think is actually the best parallel for where we are right now, the second clan is really if you want a historic parallel in the United States, that's where you go. And if you have not read plug this everywhere. Kelly Baker's The Gospel According to the Klan. This is my favorite book on American history. Uh, everyone should buy and read this book. And it's all about the fact that the Second Klan is an aggressively Protestant organization uh, building itself on very specifically Christian nationalist lines. Um, they have a huge women's auxiliary movement, even though women are not allowed to join the Klan because they're women. One of the most important writers writing novels and pamphlets and treatises supporting them is a woman who's never allowed to join because she's a woman, but she's doing it anyway. The building of the lost cause mythology of the South is done largely through the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And there is a widespread movement of women supporting these ideas, even though most of them don't become the cans themselves. Though I say that, Carrie Lake. We sure dodged a bullet there. So there's that. I mean, we can at least celebrate the, the veto power that she's going to have because what we've seen, especially with the, uh, you know, with Governor Ducey, is the extremist behavior has really exploded at the state capitol. And um, so at the very least, hopefully when they start writing these bills, and I haven't gotten word on any bills coming out yet, but when they do, hopefully they'll consider the fact that this time you're not going to have a governor who is going to sign off on everything that you do. And, and that's our that. great hope. And we have election integrity with the Secretary of State win as well. Um, so Diane uh, has another question. Earlier you referred to the goose and she wants to know if that has to do with mother goose. Uh, no, um, though, though that would have been fun. Uh, I, I do enjoy, I do enjoy ruining a good Grimm's, uh, a good fairy tale as much as the next person. No, that one, uh, that one, as far as I can tell is unconnected to that. It's a story that when um, you encounter it in the Latin Chronicles is, is really attempting to convince you like these people are all idiots. Like, look at how stupid these people are. They're, they're following a woman who's following a goose. That's so stupid. And then you read in the Jewish accounts, like, yeah, they were following a goose and then they broke down the walls and began burning the synagogue. No, no laughing matter. Yeah. No laughing um, matter. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, she also asks, Diane does, uh, how much of the enormous sword and other sword iconography is related to the penis? And I do feel like the mm. more guns you own, the, I mean, it's indicative of size, perhaps. Uh, or certainly fears about size. Um, the sword imagery, usually not, though there's at least one first uh, crusade chronicle where the chronicler goes on a great length about impaling women on lances, but not sexually assaulting them. And it's like, man, you're spending a lot of time talking about penetration to give yourself a pat on the back for the fact that you didn't rape them too. Um, it's horrifying. I mean, I, I think that that, you know, if you go with the worst interpretation of Crusaders, you're probably like as a Crusade historian, I think if you go with the most negative view of Crusaders, you're probably right. And you could then that probably go a little bit more negative. Uh, OK, so uh, the next question, 
and I, I think this is more maybe rhetorical, but could we require psychological tests before letting anyone join the military? But if we did and they turned out masculine, their behavior is normal, so it would help. Well, Again, it's I it's the problem where the radicalization is happening within the military, right? All of the people that I that I selected for this um, are military officers who served in areas where there was a predominantly Muslim population and are coming out of this in the specific holy war mold. So Matt Shea served in Kuwait and Bosnia Herzegovina. Um, Boykin and West were in Iraq. Um, Mastriano was in Iraq in the first Gulf War and wrote uh, one of his master's theses on like a really bizarre kind of like weird prophetic anti Saddam Hussein text. Um, Michael Flynn, who makes an excellent example but deserves his own like four hour long rant and so I decided not to bring him in but it, it's it's the same kind of thing that it's people who have you ever read um anyone read Kathleen Ballou's bring the warm war home. It's a brilliant book on how um, coming out of Vietnam in the 80s and 90s, you, you get people coming and bringing, bringing the, what's going on in Vietnam and kind of anti-government activity as a result of, of that war home to build right-wing militia groups. And so it's like a really important book for studying the militia movement in the 80s and 90s. I desperately wish she'd write a follow-up on that same activity coming into now with these military officials and veterans who come out of Iraq and Afghanistan and either become these kind of Christian nationalist figureheads or the number of, I mean, like groups like Oath Keepers and Proud Boys and Patriot Front all claim to have a fairly high percentage of veterans and police that are members of the group. And the numbers tend to be internal claims, which makes them really squiffy. I don't, I don't trust any of these fascists further than you can throw them. But there are enough of them that it's concerning. Well, and I think that's a natural uh, uh, segue into another question. So I'm going to skip real quick because Dennis says, are Christian militias sufficiently well-coordinated to pose a threat to regular police forces? No. Um, whew. How to put this in the most part. How many of you have listened to Rage Against the Machine? Yeah, some of some of those who burn crosses are the, are the same workforces. They they think the police are on their side. They're not wrong. And and that that is really worrisome. And then that's you know, incredibly Mary, worrisome. Yeah. And Mary points out, full disclosure here, Mary um, you know, was the district manager in LD2, where I, you know, just uh, ran a race for state senate. And I didn't really realize that I just kind of assumed that the picture on the signs of, of my opponent were related to the military, like some kind of military mm. cross on there. But it was exactly the, uh, you know, the cross that you showed us earlier. And so Ooh. she says the Holy War symbol, the same image that Steve Kaiser used on some of his political signs, the one he had in his background during the debate specifically. Can you, can you send me a copy of this image? Yeah, maybe if Mary, if you maybe have one of those too, that would be great. And she can send it to me and then we can send it to you. But it had that, it had uh, that cross in the, and I, I, again, I feel silly now that I didn't realize it was kind of a dog whistle for um, folks who understand the message. Oh, there's Kaiser's website. Let's see if it's on there. I'm not really sure, but you can take a look at that. And, uh, I'm going to start. Your... <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Well, and immediately you have an image of him in what, in Iraq? Yep. Oh, man. This yeah, is, so this is fun. We like this. This is definitely not going to give me anxiety. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a it's a strange it, we're on we're living on a strange timeline. I know that we're coming to the end. Um uh Aaron is here on the chat saying our new constables campaign signs were God, guns, family, country. Yep. Which which <laughs> do you remember like when um the gubernatorial candidate in the primaries uh in Georgia was doing uh what Jesus Jesus guns babies? Right. And everyone's like what a lunatic and since she normalized it so much that it then like it's totally normal everywhere else right and that's that's the thing that's always like everyone's like oh this is extreme rhetoric they'll definitely not carry this on yes they will they'll absolutely keep going on they'll push it on even more heavily to the next level it never goes away this rhetoric is is unfortunately fairly normal for these groups um and anytime people take it to the next rhetorical extreme, they will keep pushing onwards. Yep, I wrote I wrote a piece on her uh, in Salon uh, earlier this year. I don't even know when earlier this year anymore. I've written so many bloody pieces on these people. Um, it's bad. It's really bad. I'd, I'd love to say nice things, but I really don't have nice things to say about it. 
Well, and the thing is too, you know, I can I can only speak for myself, but I'm guessing probably that a lot of folks who are on this call right now um, have lost family members to it. You know, people that used to seem like really rational, compassionate people have really gone down this cult uh, rabbit hole and, and relationships have been destroyed because of it. Um, I'm gonna just, because again, I wanna honor everybody's time. There's a lot of engagement today. So that just speaks volumes to you. Make sure that um, you know you followed uh, Dr. Lepak on Twitter. It's it's really it's it's really well, for as long as that lasts. We'll for see. as long as it lasts, <laughs> right? Um, you can feel free to hunt me down on LinkedIn if you just want my writings without my uh, my rants about other things. But uh, right. the, you know, as long as as long as there are platforms, I'm going to keep using it to to hammer home this point because this is this is a very real and ongoing problem. For sure. And Brandy Reese, who was a candidate in, oh boy, is it, I think it was LD14. Um, she was a House candidate. Um, and thank you so much, Brandy, for stepping up. But she says, let us not forget the women that stood at the RNC in 2020 yep. and talked yep. about a single head of household vote. And I literally watched that when I would go to the doors, this, we call it gatekeeping, right? Uh, Where um, there are men, you know, I'm there to talk to the woman, the registered voter that's a woman in the household. And, you know, the husband will decide for that woman whether she's worthy to get the information from me. And it made me wonder how many of these men literally stand over the shoulders or just fill it out themselves and then say, sign that. That's how you're voting. I mean, yep. you know, uh, th this yep. is a, this is an LDS state, especially yep. in the North and West parts of uh, Phoenix. We have, you know, mega churches. I mean, Turning Point USA has now started a whatever they're called, the Turning Point. They're basically a church now and they're going to be yep. opening private schools in Arizona of course, of course to take are. advantage of the vouchers. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, they're, uh, we've got, we unfortunately elected a state superintendent who says he's going to do away with um, uh, bilingual education. Um, I mean, his whole entire platform was anti-CRT. And when you actually talk to somebody and say, what's CRT? They have no idea what it is because yep. it's not being taught in our K-12 schools. No, it's, being um, taught, it's being taught at graduate schools and law schools, but heaven forbid you actually have that conversation. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so let's see, is there anything else? Okay. People are sharing some great stuff. That podcast episode on the BBC about the Knight Templars, that link is in there. So make sure. Um, Brandy, yes, this is phenomenal. Thank you so much, Dr. Lecoq. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't want to take up any more time because I know everybody's got a limited schedule. So but I would like to at least keep, you know, give people some hope. And, um, and you know, despite the outcome of my race, we are going to continue this work because now, you know, from now until 2024, we are going to hold these people's feet to the fire. We really are the only voice in Arizona that, that speaks against separation of church and state at the Capitol. We mobilize our members. Our membership rates are going to be going up at the end of the year. So take advantage right now because it's, um, you know, you'll be able to uh, uh, attend these kinds of functions and things like that. And we are on a shoestring budget. So please go to secularaz.org and um, consider donating and supporting our work because where else would you be able to see such a fabulous speaker like Dr. Thomas Lecoq? I mean, thank you again so much. And thank you, um, thank you so very much. And so, you know, everybody's allowed to take a break till the end of this year, I think. And then we all need to get out there. We need to go to our uh, legislative district meetings. We need to become precinct committee people. We need to go to our school board meetings. And as um, I think Jude pointed out in the chat, we also apparently need to change our request to speak passwords at the Capitol. So that's a good thing to know <laughs> that we have a system here in Arizona. It's called RTS, a request to speak, where anybody can, and, and not that anybody listens, but maybe now with the Democratic governor, They'll start listening to us. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah. Fingers crossed. And <laughs> good luck to all of you. Well, good, thank luck. you. good luck to us all. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. This was so enjoyable. And yeah. everybody have a great weekend. Take care. Thank you so very much. Have a good day. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.